Dominique and Janice has. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out um, on kind of a last second notice. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to Dominique and Janet for opening up your home. Yeah, thanks. So we thank you. Experience this. And uh, I was just telling your friend, I only met Dominique and Janet about six weeks ago, but it feels like we've known each other since the 80s. So, feel like <laughs> so you guys are rocking. Thank you so much. Um, as well, um, it says that God is kind, so his nature is kind, so therefore whatever he does is kind. So too, I guess, uh, one could draw the parallel that Rabbi Shmuley is a creator, he's a producer, he puts out, he speaks, he writes, etc. So there is no rest for the weary, so uh, Baruch Hashem, we got to do a speech last week, and then uh, I thought we'd slink back into our Maui oblivion, but no such luck, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> Shmuley, uh, Rabbi Shmuley uh, said he wanted to speak again, Baruch Hashem, and then we're able to gather, you know, we're speak uh, last night Dominic and I were speaking, and said, you know, even if one person shows up, one, the Talmud says that why did God create the world with one person, two people, Adam and Eve, he just said every person is the whole world. He said, even if it's just us, it's the whole world. With Baruch Hashem, we have many universes here, so thank God, thank you guys all for coming out. Gary Shmuley for agreeing to do this, and um, I won't say much because we'll hear from Rabbi Shmuley, but tomorrow night and in the Thursday night and Friday is Lag Omer, which is the day of the passing of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the great sage who wrote the Zohar. And uh, he's always equated with the redemption, right? So when he was alive, it was as if the redemption was here. So for anyone who has like, experienced true love, it's like the redemption. So it's very fitting that we're having it. Uh, this is this topic today, and Rabbi Shmuel will tell us more so why it is fitting. And uh, lastly, which would be most fitting for the speech, I just want to thank Mushka, because she's the best. And, um, <laughs> thank you all. We're now here from Rabbi Shmuley. And lastly, Thursday, tomorrow, 4 p.m., Camp 3, we will be celebrating Lag Omer. Um, it may be a little less salacious than tonight will be, but uh, it should be wonderful. So please join us, and <laughs> Rabbi Shmuley, please all thank you. Uh, thank you. enjoy. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rabbi Kaziansky. Thank you, Mushka Chabad of Maui, the best. I'm learning this. <laughs> I love it. Being Jewish. <laughs> Life in New York. Hang loose. Life in Hawaii. That's why they do this. If you're not in Hawaii, this is you. <laughs> and if you're why you're here. That's, that's the idea. Continental U.S. So I'm planning to stay here. I already said last week I'm never leaving, so I'm still here. Aww. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> All the people who follow me on social media are wondering, like, what? how long are you going to stay in Hawaii? <laughs> as long as you I am Hawaiian. <laughs> <laughs> My wife is very observant. My wife, Debbie, she says, uh, and she's having to hold this phone, um, she said to me, you know, the Hawaiian people, like, they really identify much more with being Hawaiian than even like being American. It seems like mm. Hawaiian flags everywhere. You barely see the American flags. I, I get it. I get it. <laughs> this is America. This is the Hawaiian. We're on our way up. Okay. Um, yes. It's such a pleasure being here. And one of the things that I love is uh, connecting with local Jewish communities and uh, many of the non-Jewish members who are attached to Jewish communities around the world but especially uh, smaller communities, because um, they're so important. And let me therefore begin by uh, recognizing, again, uh, Rabbi Mendy Kraz, one of our family's closest friends, and his wife, Mushka, for everything they do here. And there's nothing that Mendy could have done more for us uh, over the past week. Uh, he really overdid it in, in terms of taking care of us. Uh, and we become spoiled, so... Um, <laughs> You did offer to drop grapes in my mouth. I, guess, <laughs> I, think, I think that I'll accept the offer. Well, thank you for the community, and I hope that you'll get everyone's support, and God willing, continue to build the community here, and build Chabad of Maui, and your parents have put three decades into the island, and now you're continuing with uh, the tradition here in Maui, and God bless you for everything that you do, and I look forward to seeing, since, since we're supposed to leave, but you need tests to go, and we had, like, what a day trying to get the right test to get out of here. Um... <laughs> I was supposed to be somewhere for Lag Bomber. I think I, I'll probably do it like next Lag Bomber. Still trying to get the right place <laughs> to, get out of, to get out of Hawaii. And uh, Dominic and Janet, thank you so much for hosting us. I am in the regular habit of inviting myself to people's homes to give lectures. <laughs> so I want to speak here tomorrow as well. <laughs> you guys, but I'm kind of bringing a different crowd. And I don't want you to kind of rain in my parade. You guys, can you go out for dinner tomorrow night? <laughs> While we take over the house? <laughs> You're laughing. I'm kind of serious. <laughs> Thank you very much for having us. This is like a crazy speech to give. Don't. I, 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 I got to tell you, on the one hand, I don't even really want to like talk 
else to do that. I don't want to get stars. <laughs> I was going to go up, right? The stars are spectacular from here. I was looking at them as we, as we drove up this mountain. And, um, but I, I, giving a speech, and as it is, whenever I speak about kosher sex, kosher love, uh, we, did, we did politics in Israel just a week ago here in Maui. Now here we are. Make love, not war, right? We're talking not about conflict, but about harmony. But I feel like I'm perched, like on a... Oh, my God. Like the flying, what do they call the flying Walendas? You know, they, they're like on this tight wire. I'm gonna like be in the middle of making my most important points. I'm just gonna <laughs> over. Yeah, exactly. You know, in Hawaii, like anything can finish you up. <laughs> if God forbid COVID 19 doesn't get you, thank God the islands have dealt very, very much better than the continental US with COVID 19. But if that doesn't get you, everywhere you drive around Hawaii, there's like markers, people who drove off a cliff, because, <laughs> or this guy was eaten by a rhino, and like, how many ways are there to die in a while? It's not something real, really chill islands. Everywhere we go, there's memorials for Torres, and the signs. We went to a beach the other day, I kid you not, I took a picture of it. As you go in, it shows a picture of a man being eaten by a shark, and it says, shark, you know, danger of shark attack. Are you kidding me? A beach showing someone being eaten by a shark? God Almighty! <laughs> and now I'm giving a speech about to fall backward. It's, this looks like an infinite abyss. This looks like, <laughs> is there anything behind me? What? Water. It's like, it's just the, the infinite unknown. But this kind of space behind me is actually a great metaphor for um, the dark matter of the universe. It sometimes pushes things apart. Um, physicists call it um, antimatter. This mysterious force, we don't even know what it is. It's pushing the galaxies apart, it's pushing the planets apart, it's pushing the stars further away from each other. That antimatter in human terms is what we call hatred. Hatred is irrational hatred, is when you dislike someone with no cause. And you get pushed further and further apart. And you can't even explain why. You take an instant dislike to someone without even understanding why you dislike them. Or you find something not to like about them that's utterly trivial. Love, of course, is the exact opposite. Love is the light that brings us all together. And Chabad and the Rebbe always emphasize the idea of irrational love. Almost all forms of love are, are very rational. Men are attracted to women who are attractive, beautiful. Women are attracted to men who are handsome or manly. Um, or we're attracted to people who are successful. We're attracted to people who are funny. There's always a good reason to be attracted to be drawn to someone. The idea of being drawn to someone without cause, without a reason, is utterly irrational. It's funny, we're not put off by irrational hatred. We kind of just accept that some people we take an instant dislike to them, and yet we never fully embrace the idea of irrational love, of super rational love, of love without a cause. And I start by speaking about this tonight because Lag Omer, which is a, a not well-known Jewish holiday, I would say that maybe 5% of Jews have even heard of it. But it's this great light in the middle of the Omer, a, a dark period in Jewish history, where thousands and thousands of the greatest scholars in ancient Israel died because they hated each other irrationally, and God sent a plague, and they, and they died, the students of Rabbi Akiva. And then the Lag Omer, they stopped dying. And we celebrate this day that pulls us out of the darkness of the seven weeks that follow Passover as we march toward the giving of the Torah, and Mount Sinai and Shavuos, 3,300 years ago. The Lag Bomer, we barely heard of it, so all these students, 24,000 students died, all except five died, because they hated each other irrationally. And God got a bit fed up with it. Like, <laughs> there's enough hatred in the world, there's so much hatred in the world. And, you know, when I was a kid and I would hear this, why would these students dislike each other for no reason, especially if they're very Torah scholars? But now in modern America, I understand it, I see it. We all hate each other for no reason at all, the stupidest of reasons. These aren't the United States of America, these are the divided states of America. Irrational hatred is what is defining our era. If you're black in the United States, you feel that you could be shot at any moment which is walking down the streets. If you're Jewish, you read about massacres in shuls, things that I, I didn't know anything about in the United States when I grew up. Who grew up? We knew that happened in, in, in Germany in the Holocaust. We knew it happened in France, in Belgium, in Israel, unfortunately, in terrible attacks. But in the United States, in Pittsburgh, or in Poway, California? Are you kidding me? 
Republicans, Democrats, progressives, conservatives, where did all this, this, this ocean of hatred come from? Because hate is actually exciting. And love is a total bore. So much so, I know that when you look at the music of the Beatles, you could wrongly conclude that love is actually exciting, that they became the greatest rock sensation of all time because they actually they sang about very simple romantic, romantic interactions, like someone holding someone's hand. You would never hear a song like that 40 years later. You would never hear today's rap culture. No one is going to have lyrics about how someone wants to hold a woman's hand. That's like unheard of. Back then, it was a more innocent age, perhaps. <clears throat> 60s, people reach or something higher. But now we're back to what always was, which is that hatred is actually extremely exciting. And the more divisive you are, the bigger your social media following. The more you instill hatred, the more fascinating you are as a personality. Look at the people who are best known in the United States. They're the people who sow the most division and the most hatred. And the people who sow the most love. We, we, we barely want to read about them. I'll prove it. Easy about how, how interesting hatred is and how off-putting, or boring, I should say, love can be. Who is the most famous humanitarian of our generation, or last generation, our lifetime? Mm. Probably Mother Teresa. Yeah. And yet, how many biographies have there been about Mother Teresa? Who wants to actually know about her life? So I know, I think there are two that I know of. One of them is positive. The other one was written by someone who I knew quite well, Christopher Hitchens world's most famous atheist who died about six years ago. I like him very much. He and I had many debates together. Some of the debates have been watched by millions and millions of people. But he wrote a devastating biography about Mother Teresa called The Missionary Position. <laughs> and uh, basically saying that she was terrible. So two about Mother Teresa that I know, or maybe there's more. And one is an unflattering portrayal. How many biographers are, are there of Adolf Hitler? Mm -hmm. May his name be erased. How many? I saw somewhere recently there's about 5,000. Mm. Uh, I know I've read probably 20. Mm. The one by Volker Ulrich, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, is phen phenomenal, written in German, translated into English. The second volume just came out a few months ago. I just finished that. And then there was Ian Kershaw. My gosh, how many? Then my friend Professor Norman Stone from Oxford, who died not long ago, he wrote a famous biography of Hitler. Mm. I've read them and read them and read them, trying to understand you know, this incarnation of evil. Like what, what, what drove it? And we'll never understand it. My book, Holocaust Holiday, which focuses not on Hitler, but on the Holocaust, the first books arrived in our home two days ago. I haven't even seen it. My kids sent me pictures, and I'm very proud of the book. It'll be out. It's being released May 4th. Um, mm. The devastation of the Holocaust. Uh, the Holocaust Holiday is about a trip that I took with my kids to uh, maybe 100 Holocaust sites over several summers, especially the summer of 2017. Mm. You can read something about the book in the Washington Post, and if you Google my name, it's a, an interesting book. They allowed me to publish like a two and a half thousand words uh, summation, a summary of a book recently. But Hitler, evil, fascinating. Good. Why is that? Why is hatred so interesting? Why is love so non-compelling? Let me just prove my point. The Oscars were two nights ago. Mm. The movies that won are, are, are very interesting. I've seen a lot of them. They're mostly art house movies that won this year. Um, maybe in the year of COVID, the big studios are not releasing big budget films. So films like Nomadland, The Father got a lot of attention. Nomadland won for Best Picture. Anthony Hopkins won for Best Actor in, in, in The Father. Small budget movies and very, very artistic and very thought provoking and very, very dark. No Man Land is about people who experience grief who can't handle it and they just go on a journey to nowhere forever. Never finding a place to call home. The father is about a man who slowly experiences dementia. I could barely watch it because my father died a year ago. The yard site is coming up um, May 11th on the secular calendar. And uh, one of the reasons I could be here now is that I finished my 11 months of cottage. I couldn't even travel before for long, for long trips. Um, and on that night, May 11th, I'm doing an event with Dr. Oz from TV, the world's most famous doctor, and Brett Stevens, the Pulitzer Prize winning columnist in the New York Times, at our home on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, the World Values Network headquarters about grief. And I couldn't even watch The Father. We watched it the other night. 
so it's just reminded me of my father too much, and uh, and the travails of uh, of aging. And uh, where are the romantic movies about love? About I'm not saying we shouldn't have the other side. We should. These are amazing films. But where is the other side? We don't even portray it anymore. Can someone tell me a famous, happy movie about real love that wasn't a comedy? Anything? Over the past few years? Tell me the name. No, tell me one movie that was just about a man and a woman falling in love, staying in love, huh. and and that just lifted you up about the beauty of romance and beauty of love, and, and it just electrified America with its portrayal of real love and romance. Can anyone think of any of it? Or a sitcom on TV? Or a recent Netflix series? Or a Hulu series? Or an Amazon Prime series that's about that specifically? Any, any of them? Mm. A serious question. No, not that I it, It's shocking, isn't it? And why? No one's going to watch it. Because <laughs> no one believes that it could be real. <laughs> no one believes that love could be sustained. No one believes... On a microcosmic level, we don't really believe that love can be sustained in long-term relationships. So we're not going to watch movies about happy marriages because we don't believe they really exist. Mm. And on a macrocosmic level, we see strife between nations. We see a, a dominant nationalism where, you know, I, it doesn't mean nationalism is a bad thing, but, but nationalism that excludes someone else and pushes them far away and believes that one group is superior to another, that's not something Judaism could ever endorse. That's what we're kind of into right now. Mm. So no one's going to do a romantic movie because everyone's going to say, ah, it's not Oh, the other one about drug cartels massacring each other, betting each other. Absolutely, Netflix has put out ten thousand series. How many more narcotic traffickers can be portrayed in a Netflix series? I mean, how many more narcos Mexico, narcos Hawaii, narcos Malibu, narcos like every month? But you don't have like <clears throat> happy marriage Malibu, happy marriage marriage. Just doesn't exist. And in, in the midst of all that comes this. Festival of Lodge Lama that actually says, you know what, love is not a fantasy. And love is not an illusion. And love is something very real. Mm -hmm. What's I want to talk about? I'm going to talk about it on a microcosmic level and a macrocosmic level. Normally I only talk about it on a microcosmic level. I wrote Kosher Sex, I wrote Kosher Adultery, I wrote... That's, that's a one-word book. Kosher Adultery. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. There is no Kosher Adultery. It's actually a very interesting book. It's about how to turn your marriage into an affair. But I wrote... Kosher Lust, I wrote, uh, I wrote Lust for Love with uh, Pamela Anderson, that was published two years ago, uh, we co-authored that book. I, so I know we speak about this only on a microcosmic level, as it pertains to marriage, and erotic love, romantic love, sexual love, passionate, intimate love. Tonight I'm, only, I'm not only going to focus on that, I'm going to broaden it to also a macrocosmic love for two reasons. First of all, it's Lodge Bellman more of a macrocosmic idea between people, nations, communities, and also because there's a child here, which is a beautiful thing, thank God. <laughs> I'm a child. My wife tells me that all the time. <laughs> and finally, because Chabad of Mary have done such a great job spreading Judaism, the last thing I want is for Rabbi Mendel Kraz to suddenly suffer because of me. I'm going to give a lecture on kosher sex, and tomorrow, World Chabad headquarters is going to call him up, oh my God, <laughs> you know, we're cutting you off. <laughs> and then he's going to say, you can't come to Mary anyway, you don't have the right test, you can't touch me. It's going to take you 10 years to figure out which is the right test. You're going to get a test, and they're going to tell you you have the wrong test, and then get the airport and send you back, and they're going to quarantine you, and then put you in jail, and they're going to, so you can't touch me anyway, and he's fine. Says, no one get them out. It's impossible to get into these islands. God. Why does not Hawaii just tell everybody, don't come up? <laughs> we tried. It's far better to say that than to say, you can come based on a test that you can't get. And don't worry, because you have to show that you're COVID negative within 72 hours before you leave for a test that takes 92 hours to get back. So you're in this incredible cash money. Okay. Let's begin with microcosmic love. And then I'll go to macrocosmic love. And then I'll take your question. It's become almost axiomatic that <laughs> marriages or long-term relationships can't survive. That love just cannot last. Mm -hmm. I love Iceland. There's a few places I really love in the world. I love Hawaii. Love it. I love Dominic's house, and I'm not leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I love Iceland. Oh, I love Iceland. So we go to Iceland a lot. We try pre-COVID. 
while Alaska, uh, Iceland is like a closer version of Alaska to us. We live in like New York, New Jersey area. So beautiful the glaciers. But Iceland and Scandinavia have a very interesting view of marriage. They don't, people don't marry anymore. And they're not, it's not even, it's not that they're married and they're partners, they don't really believe in long-term monogamy. Not because they're cynical. They would say the opposite, they're optimists. They would say, love lasts for about eight to 10 years. After that, it gets a little bit stale. So instead of getting upset and trying to keep it together artificially, just accept that you're gonna be in love with someone about eight to 10 years. And then when it begins to get stale or, there's no upset, there's no disappointment because you never expected it to last long. It's like a car. You don't buy a car expecting it to last. You know, you buy a car these three years is the average lease. And then you know it's gonna be, you don't get upset. You expect it, that's, everything has a shelf life. Love has a shelf life. So when you go to Scandinavia, Denmark, Iceland, Finland, Norway, marriage is becoming less than 50% of the population. Iceland, I think it's only about 20% of the population. They believe in serial monogamy, which I've always thought is a little bit like being a serial killer. Or something, <laughs> you know, serial, serial monogamy, but serial monogamy is about eight to 10 years with someone, you never cheat on them. You don't believe in being unfaithful, but you also don't expect that it's gonna go longer than that. Now, as a child, the divorce, now, who believes that makes sense? Doesn't, isn't that logical? The truth is, that's very logical. It is, come on. There's a logic to it. With a 50% divorce rate, there's a logic to it. And forget the 50% divorce rate. 50% of people stay married. How many of the 50% who stay married are happy? What would you guess? Even if you made it half, that gives you only 25% of marriages that are successful. So serial monogamy seems to make a lot of sense. But not to me, it was a child of divorce. Because it doesn't look at when kids look at their parents and they say, wait, you brought me into this world and I'm the product of your love for each other. But from the beginning you expected it was gonna dissolve and it was going to disappear. And that means that my whole being never had long-term viability. <laughs> I mean, I, I know that divorce is very common these days. For me, growing up as a child of divorce, it was like really confusing. You know, at a, at a young age you become Henry, Henry Kissinger. I was like a diplomat. You have to make sure you don't say something about your mother that's gonna upset your father or your father from such a young age, you go for Pesach, I'm, I'm in yeshiva, do I go to my father for Pesach, do I go to my mother for Pesach? It's, mm -hmm. it's very confusing. Mm -hmm. So those who just argue with serial monogamy don't look at its long-term effects on all the people who are surrounded by this marriage or the product of this marriage. Mm -hmm. I wanna tell you why this is wrong. You see, there's a science to attraction and there's a science to love in the same way as the science to everything else. Those who say that marriage and long-term romance cannot last are like those who say that no business can really last. Apple is still on top of the world. It became a $1 trillion company, then a $2 trillion company. IBM, does it even still exist? <laughs> Serious question, does IBM exist? Yeah, of course. What do they do, like enterprise software or something like that? They became Accenture. Sorry? It's a different company, different name. Oh really, does it have a different name now? Is that right? Right. Yeah, right. from what IBM is. Yeah, you see, isn't that amazing? <laughs> IBM was dominant for so, for so long, and now it's Apple. Some people think that Apple, that everything's cyclical. Everyone's expecting the United States to decline. And, and we're, China was supposed to overtake us as the world's dominant economy, and it still hasn't happened. America's still ahead. Is it because it's luck, or is it because there is something? There's a science to longevity. There's a science to luck. There's a, sci there's a science to business success. There are three ingredients to long-term attraction. And Judaism is uniquely qualified to give us those three ingredients to long-term attraction. Mm. The Western world is not well-equipped to give us the ingredients of long-term attraction. The Western world believes that long-term attraction is based on three things. A, youth, the younger you are, the more attractive you are, which has caused this mind-boggling situation where people are afraid to even reveal their age. Aren't you proud that you've lived in love? I, I said, okay, let me just go through the age. What's the second thing that the Western world says? Money. Who said that? Looks. Who said that? I was gonna say success, but you know, that's oh, very yeah. insightful. What's what the third thing? What was the question? Yeah, physical appearance. Yeah. Physical appearance, success, yeah. youth. Some would say that youth and physical appearance are the same thing. Isn't that cynical? Wow, okay. <laughs> Those three things. As I said, it led to a decent situation where people won't even admit 
with their ages. I counsel a lot of couples. I've counseled straight couples. I've counseled gay couples. I've counseled married couples. I've counseled couples who live together. I've counseled divorced couples. They've all been so forthcoming about the most intimate aspects of their lives. It's incredible. You ask them about their sex lives, you're a stranger then. They walk into your house for counseling. Ten minutes later, they'll tell you anything. But if I say to, say, the woman, and, and how old are you? Ah, damn it! <laughs> the chutzpah! We barely know each other! And, and when did you lose your virginity? Oh, that's easy. I, this is, this, this, this age, no problem with it. And how old are you? How dare you! The chutzpah! Asking an intimate question like that. <laughs> Astonishing. We've made women ashamed to say, they hate their birthdays. They get depressed on their birthdays. Gosh, we've made women especially <coughs> hate eating. Eating. The most natural human function there is to just consume calories to stay alive. You eat a cube of cheese and you like get your Yom Kippur and you're like doing al and thanking <laughs> God for forgiveness and, 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 and I know I shouldn't have done the cube of cheese and damn cube of cheese and anti-Semitic cheese I don't know what the heck why did I eat this garbage cheese and... um, but you know how silly those three things are and then success they say that uh, they say that marriage is the price that women pay. Oh, how does this go? I'll come back to that. This is not. It's a great. It's a great quote. But it's not yet relevant. Success. They say that men look for sex objects and women look for success objects. Hmm. That success is uh, very attractive. Hmm. <laughs> I don't. I don't have a lot of time to refute those three things other than to say the greatest reputation is how often they change. Take what Jennifer Lopez has done to the whole idea of youthfulness. How old is she now? 52, 53? So half the women are saying it's horrible what Jennifer Lopez is doing because every, everyone who's in the 50s feel they have to look like Jennifer Lopez. The other half are saying, thank God, because now we're showing that women who are in their 50s can look like they're these incredible sex objects. But regardless of that debate, it just goes to show, the fact that we're debating at all shows age is not about beauty. <coughs> to the contrary, we are a culture that's become obsessed with age and thinness, especially for women, which is very foreign historically. Historically, women who were more curvaceous and more fleshy were seen as the very attractive women, and the ones who were super thin, that was not seen as attractive. Here's proof. Go to the world's greatest masters, Rembrandt, Rubens, and they all painted Michelangelo, Da Vinci, they all painted very curvaceous women. That was the standard of beauty. Today, of course, it's kind of like an emaciated scarecrow, and that's supposed to be, and if women don't achieve that look, they're punished. How did it change? Simple. Because back then, hundreds of years before the age of television, before the age of low cut, magazine covers, men used to make love with their hands. Today, in this visual age, men make love with their eyes. And what's the difference? To the eyes, to the, to the eyes, thin is in, because the eyes use very linear, uh, the eyes use pixels, like if you look at a computer screen or a photograph, it's, it's pixelated. So the pixels are all about lines. It's about the intersection of pixels, and that's what creates beauty. But, so to the eyes, thin is in, but to the hands, Back when men used to make love with their hands, not with their eyes. It's not thin as in, it's neat. Is neat. <laughs> What's more pleasurable? Make love to a bag of bones and a ribcage or soft, supple flesh? Soft. soft. So everything, so everything has changed. It's changed. The standards of beauty have changed. In the days of Da Vinci, if you could live to your 50s, you were the most glorious person in the world. There are three secrets, Jewish secrets of attraction. 
totally different to the Western, the Western Trinity. Here's the Jewish. I was going to say the Jewish Trinity. That doesn't. That doesn't. Go <laughs> Judaism says that attraction is about three things, and the Jewish marriage is based on all these three things. Number one, the first secret of attraction is unavailability. Exact opposite of what, say, Hawaiian beaches believe. <laughs> the Hawaiian beaches, especially the ones that are clothing optional, or so my friends tell me, <laughs> um, all believe that attraction is about total visibility, total availability. Judaism says the opposite. Attraction is all based on unavailability. Let me just prove my point. Why, does, why is all fast food bad? All of it. No one ever says, it's our anniversary, I'm taking you to Burger King. <laughs> no matter how expensive, even if Burger King costs $100 per burger, you wouldn't, because it's bad food. Fast food is all bad. How's that possible? It can't all be bad. It's not about the food, it's about the fast. It's too available. Your, your glands don't have time to, there's no anticipation. You don't salivate, you don't await the food. Anything which is instantly available is instantly unattractive. So when a man leaves his wife for his mistress, studies show that he usually divorces her within the first year. When she was unavailable, and he had a wife, she had a husband, that tension and that obstacle actually created greater lust, greater desire. Now that she's always available, she becomes far less attractive. Did she change? Did her image change? Did her body change? No! The circumstances changed from unavailable to always available. It changed from, are we going to meet secretly next Wednesday, to, why aren't you home yet? It's five o'clock. You never want to be home. <laughs> the circumstances change. It's not the food. It's the fast. That's why fast food restaurants all have very bright lighting. And expensive romantic restaurants are very soft light. The idea of the bright light is to make you feel uncomfortable, exposed. So you eat and leave. You don't get comfortable in a McDonald's. You leave, because they make their money through quantity, through volume. Expensive restaurants make their money through expensive bottles of wine. They want you to sit for six or seven hours, just taking your time. You make a reservation for seven, you stay till 11. Because in the soft lighting, you don't feel exposed. And it's more mysterious, and the attraction is so much greater. And even if they serve you one of the specials, which has been piping hot ready from hours before, just like a McDonald's hamburger, if you order it, they're going to make you wait 20 minutes out, they're going to make you say, sir, we waited. And it's been sitting there in the, in the kitchen because they want, it's only going to taste good if it's unavailable. The first secret of a Jewish marriage is that husbands and wives are unavailable to each other for about half the month, erotically, romantically, and physically unavailable to each other. That sounds like the exact opposite of what marriage should be. Marriage should be about confident availability. But you see, the people who believe that are those who mistakenly believe that love is more important than lust. Love is about constant availability. Think about your friends. People you're closest to in friendship, people you can tell anything to. And you call them, they're always... If you call someone who's a friend and they can never talk to you, the friendship diminishes. So we think marriages should be the same. It should be total availability. Total sexual availability, physical availability, romantic availability. Talk about anything and everything. Walk, walk around utterly unclothed in front of each other constantly. All these things are ingredients for the absence, the diminishment of attraction. All the, because marriage is not based on love. Marriage is based on lust, on desire. The single most important ingredient in any successful relationship is desire. It's to want each other. Love is what you have between your best friends. Desire and lust is what you have between two lovers. Why do we now believe that relationships should be about being best friends? Because we are so cynical about the, uh, about the possibilities of long-term attraction actually being viable, that we've replaced it with this dumb phrase that this is my wife, she's my best friend. That's unbelievable when you think about it. What do you guys do? Like, watch football together? She's your best friend? Are you kidding me? What are you, dorm together? We used to use words like soulmates. We used to use words like lover. There was an intensity 
in the expression. And now, my best friend, people call their dogs their best friends. Marriage, love is something so much more intense. But we have ripped the fire out of it. And we have this nice, calm, a lot of relationships are supposed to have a certain turbulence. Not an unhealthy turbulence. I'm not talking about unhealthy drama. I'm talking about fire. Which leads us to the second ingredient of attraction. It's called mystery. Unavailability. Mystery. Walk into any shul and look for the Torah, the holiest object in our entire religion. I just dedicated the Torah to my father's memory two weeks ago tonight. Exactly. Two weeks ago, last Wednesday, two weeks ago Wednesday, we had Secretary of State Mike Pompeo give a, give a speech. We completed the Torah in my father's memory. It was a great honor. Mm. You can see the pictures in the video uh, on, our, on, on my social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, yeah, it took us five, 11 months to write it. And if you go to any shul and you want to see the Torah, where is it? Well, to see a Torah, you got to first open the velvet curtain of the ark, and you have to open the wooden doors, and you have to take the, it's four or five steps. Because the mystery of the Torah is what gives us a sense of reverence and awe. You go to any shul, any synagogue, they bring out the Torah, and people immediately stand up. There's reverence, there's awe. It's kind of the opposite of, say, Bahabdo, or say, a crucifix, where you walk into a church, and the first thing you see is the founder of the faith, giving his life for the faithful, but in a very exposed position. That would never happen in a shul. Where the Torah is it's unavailable and it's mysterious. God is utterly mysterious. God is utterly unavailable. That's why mankind has always had this incredibly powerful, electrifying gravitation toward God. God has been the dominant theme of humanity that's why one of the things I love about going through those great museums, I try to take my kids to the Louvre and the Prado and the Uffizi and the Met and the MoMA and all of the great masters. Their religious themes dominated art because the mystery of God is something that drew the most artistic, creative minds. <laughs> Unavailability, and yet we're so available to each other these days. And mystery, we don't believe in mystery. We're told that long-term relationships are first and foremost about communication, trust. Exposing absolutely everything to one another with no barrier. And then we wonder why people are, we're beginning to develop very unhealthy appetites. Gosh, do you know how many men I counsel in marriages who become porn addicts? Do you know what porn is doing to the modern male brain? I'll tell you what it's doing. I'm not just speaking about misogyny or how it portrays women. I'm not just speaking about what happens to so many of these women who are involved in, 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 in the sex trade or the porn industry. I'm talking about, notice how it's diminishing men's attraction to women. Men can only be attracted to women in incredible volume. You go to a porn, porn site, you see a picture of a naked woman, you click the picture. And 10,000 other pictures immediately pop up. Or, again, so my friends tell me. So I've heard. <laughs> Can't verify this on my own. Because, because men are no longer attracted to a kind of woman. One woman. They're attracted to womankind. Only in volume. The lack of mystery, the lack of availability, and the constant availability. Thousands and thousands of videos. Of stuff that's destroying the male erotic mind. But the biggest place we think is actually an attraction. We think that porn addicts are attracted to women. The exact opposite is true. They're not. When I debated Larry Flint, who died about three months ago, he was a very nice man. I got to know him. I debated him twice. Tw three times, I think. Once on national TV on Fox News, on Judith Regan's show. Then I debated him. Roseanne Barr lives on the Big Island. She moderated the debate between me and Larry Flint in front of 3,000 thousands of people in Los Angeles, I think in 2001. And I visited him in his office, and I said to him in a debate, I said, you know, you're supposed to be a brilliant businessman. You're so rich, and you can't be a good businessman. Because 
why would you pay 12 separate models to be the centerfolds of your magazines for every month of the year? Just use one and reproduce the pictures 12 times. Save the money. That's what the Jewish brain would do. And of course he laughed, knowing that no one would buy the magazine if it showed the same woman undressed. This January, she was also in the February, March. No one would buy it. Doesn't that prove that porn destroys the male attraction to women? Doesn't that begin to explain why Judaism insists on modesty between men and women? The mikvah, 12, 12 days of sexual unavailability, and then sinias, the idea of modesty. We think that Orthodox synagogues have a divider between men and women, because I just, I just read this. Yuval Noah Harari, who wrote Safety, is one of the most brilliant men of the planet. The guy is too smart. And I was reading in one of his books, his past shelves, and Rabbi Kraus was telling me he was also reading one of his books. But I read Sapiens too, and but this week, I'm re I was reading his book, uh, 20, 21 Lesson Lessons of the 21st Century. My son was in some of his classes at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. My son, Mendy, whose secular birthday was today. And he was Rabbi Kraz's good friend. Um, Yuval Noah Harari says, <laughs> he says, the reason why, he said in, in the book that I read this week, the reason why Orthodox synagogues have a divide between men and women is that women are so men Thank God we're going to see a woman that can have terrible thoughts. <laughs> you know, it's almost laughable. First of all, Mechis is like this high. <laughs> Unless you want to, like, God we're going to decapitate all the women, I don't see you. Wait. But then this, and then you say, well, the old ultra orthodox ones have. Okay. But the funny thing is, he just doesn't understand it at all. The reason there's a divide between men and women in an orthodox school is because God wants there to be more barriers between men and women projecting the idea of a unisex culture where men and women kind of morph into each other and there's no mystery, there's no, there's constant availability and men are no longer attracted to women at all. You will know what Harari thinks that you put a mechitza to make sure because men are going to have bad thoughts. The exact opposite is true. We put a mechitza because men no longer have bad thoughts. There's no erotic. And women don't have erotic thoughts. Men and women aren't that attracted to each other anymore. Most There's no such thing as a heterosexual male anymore. Not because all men are gay, it's because the 5 to 10 percent of the population who are gay men, they're men who are attracted to other men. That leaves you, what, 90 percent of the men who are supposed to be attracted to women? They're not. They're only attracted to about a quarter of the female population. It's that. And the other 75 percent of women are all trying to look like that 25 percent, the standardized Western form of beauty, but most of them are not attracted to most women. They're a little bit older, not attracted. A little bit more curvaceous, no longer attracted. And we call ourselves heterosexual? Are you kidding me? We're only fractionally heterosexual. Because, again, it's not the women, it's not the men, it's the condition. IBM didn't die because there were idiots running it. IBM died because they didn't follow business rules. There's rules to a successful business. And there's rules to a successful relationship. And the third? So here's, getting late. So here's the, let's sum it up. Here's a test. So you can find the third state secret of attraction. Here's a test. Who can answer this question for me? So you go to any of the beaches here in Hawaii, which are so beautiful, the beaches. So this is a question for the men. And the women are walking around, bikinis, bathing suits, not wearing a lot of clothes. Okay. And what do men do at a beach? Well, they do one of two things. They either fall asleep, or they play frisbee. <laughs> so there's all these women who are not wearing a lot of clothes walking around, the guys <laughs> who are playing frisbee. And yet, the same guy will then go home to go to his hotel room, who will walk by a woman's hotel room and she accidentally left the blinds open. And she's wearing the same amount of clothing <laughs> as she would have bikini, but this time it's her underwear. It's not revealing any more flesh at all. But that guy suddenly walks by and goes, <laughs> when you walk by, someone like, oh, she's someone who accidentally left the blinds in her hotel room. Does anyone have a frisbee? I need a frisbee! <laughs> so here's the question. What changed? Why is it when men go to a beach with a thousand women in, the, in bikinis, they're falling asleep, and then you walk by one woman's room, and she accidentally leaves the blinds open, and you're caught in a moral conundrum, eh, I should just, I shouldn't look, I should just walk by. But why? Why? Why did it suddenly grip your imagination? You know? Forbidden. Unavailable? Well, well, women on the beach are also unavailable, right? Yeah. <laughs> about consent, right? 
<laughs> Anyone else? Because it's forbidden. Who said that? That's correct. It's sin, sinful. You're doing something sinful. On the beach, it's okay. Everyone's staring at each other. <laughs> but here, you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing. You're seeing something sinful. Because the, after unavailable the mystery, you have sinfulness. Now you begin to understand the Jewish marriage, right? Twelve days of sexual unavailability. Constant mysteriousness. And half the month, you are actually sinful to one another. It's quite amazing that the Jewish marriage, a husband and wife, it is a sin to be together for half the month. It's a sin. God creates this thing that we have no comprehension of anymore, this sinful marriage. Because the whole idea of living in sin is living outside of marriage. No one lives in sin inside of marriage. The people need sin. They just need kosher sin. Mm. Hmm. The title of my next book, I want. <laughs> Which leads us for me to finish off after this little bit of a display of what, how Judaism sees the ingredients of attraction and how love can be sustained between a man and a woman for the duration of their lives and to be strongly attracted to that desire. Which leads me to conclude, as I said, on a macrocosmic level. Now, the same thing kind of applies to our society. Why is there so much hatred between right and left? Political parties, nations. Well, one of the reasons is that the constant barrage of news about the other people we don't agree with, focusing on exposing their flaws, making everything available, focusing on unearthing, unearthing the worst dirt about them, has given us such a putrid view of one another that maybe we need a little bit more of mystery. Maybe I don't need to know every last sexual indiscretion of every politician on earth, which will leave no good men or women to ever want to go into public life. Maybe. We need to be a drop more forgiving. I never cared about Bill Clinton's affair with Monica Lewinsky. It wasn't my business. I cared that he didn't do a damn thing about the Rwandan genocide. When he was president of the United States and 330 Africans were being hacked to death, Tutsis, in Rwanda every hour. And he wouldn't even meet with his senior officials and his administration to even talk about the American response. Not one meeting. That was a sin. But he does in his marriage, of a sin to his wife, and I'm not his wife, and they begged for privacy, and I'm not interested in his private life. I couldn't care less. And yet everything today is just exposing total absence of mystery of all of our public officials. It's just the worst garbage junk. Maybe public officials, maybe groups are supposed to have a little bit more mystery. Maybe we've overdone it. Everything today is about an expose. So we've become so cynical in believing that the height, the needs of the near, is something really disgusting and ugly. And then we expect it, we become so cynical. And I, for one, I'm tired of that cynicism, because it's never done me any good to be a cynic. When I was younger, I was not a cynic. I was much more of an idealist. I was much more of an optimist. And I don't want to believe that getting older means becoming such a realist that you accept that the world is just so fatally flawed. Um, I met, is it Layla? Lila. Lila, I met Lila tonight, <coughs> very nice to meet you. And you have, you have a, a love shop here in Maui? Mm -hmm. And my daughter Hannah runs Coach Sex Company, she actually mm -hmm. created a company based on the book that I wrote. And she's about to launch eight products that have taken almost two years to develop. There's like a hundred patents, I don't know, I'm probably exaggerating, there's a lot of patents. <laughs> and, uh, and all the news media were calling me and asking what I think about her company and her products. Like, like, love well, not war. I'm amazed that we've shamed sex. We've made something shame. It can be something dirty. In the same way money can be. There's dirty money and there's, there's charity. Drugs. We say drugs are horrible. Drugs save people's lives every single day. The vaccines. I know that someone gave me a lot of a rough time last week. I talked about the vaccines. Wow. Okay. Um, 
that's okay. <laughs> but even people who don't like the vaccines, I for one absolutely think they're a miracle. I'm grateful to God that we have to put this coronavirus behind us. But even if people don't like the vaccines, you still there's so many other things. Even if it's holistic medicine, people think are amazing. So drugs aren't bad, it's the abuse of drugs. Go and try to put up what's it called? Um, pharmaceutical painkillers. People destroy their lives on it. But then try to have a cavity removed without a painkiller, without Novocaine or something, and see if you can do it. It's all about whether it's used or abused, and sex is the same. Kosher sex is just that. It's kosher sex. Kosher love is just that. It's also unkosher love. Like loving people who are not worthy of it, like an affair, or loving people who are evil or wicked instead of fighting them. I was at um, Charles Lindbergh's grave two days ago with my wife. Mm -hmm. It was yesterday. It's just yesterday. I, actually, it's a true story. My wife filmed it. Uh, I was doing Facebook Live. We thank God like a, uh, we have a million, about a million followers on Facebook. And I'm doing a Facebook Live, and I walk into his grave, and I got stung on my toe. <laughs> and I said, you know, it serves me right for going to the grave of such an anti-Semite. So Charles Lindbergh is probably the most famous grave on the island of Maui, maybe in all of Hawaii. He was the most famous American of the 20th century, up until probably Franklin Delano Roosevelt. By most estimates, he became one of the most famous human beings that ever lived. He's not as famous today, but he, in his lifetime, stratosphere. And yet... Talk about unkosher love. <laughs> this guy was an apologist for Hitler and the Nazis. And he said that American Jews were trying to push, who controlled Roosevelt, pushing him into war. Mm -hmm. Just because, you know, to make money and all the, or to save European Jewry. And that's unkosher love. He disgraced himself. Mm -hmm. And what's so sad about his legacy is that he was an all American hero, a pioneer, a guy prepared to embrace mystery, fly across the Atlantic, not knowing where he would live or die. Amazing. He couldn't even see in the spirit of St. Louis. He couldn't even see in his airplane. He had to look out, stick his head up, because he had so much fuel in front, and the engine was there. You can see it today in the uh, Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, the original spirit of St. Louis. This guy was amazing. And then he disgraces himself. He disgraces himself as an American hero by becoming this bigoted hater. Well, he's an extreme example, but the country's headed in that direction. Some of it pretty horrible, <laughs> unacceptable. And it's not enough it's just to come to Hawaii. Everyone gets along because the place is beautiful and everything else. You have to learn how to experience love when you're not surrounded by just paradise. You have to be, you have to, you can't be affected by your surroundings. For those of us who live in the, the cold, the freezing cold, that's no excuse. Go to Hawaii, everyone's full of love. <laughs> So, I'll we'll go home tomorrow night and uh, we'll all light, we light bonfires to show the passion, heart of love. And uh, I'd like Kraz will probably speak about it tomorrow, I'm guessing, but also the great soul of uh, Shimon Bar Yochai, which is founder of Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, mystery, unavailable, secrets, the esoteric secrets of Judaism. So, in conclusion, um, go to kosher.sex, you'll see amazing stuff. I'm the official, I'm, I'm the love prophet on the site. My, my daughter does all the products, amazing stuff. So I'm the love prophet. So you can get courses and information from me. You get amazing stuff from her. <laughs> and as long as it's kosher, man, and kosher means exclusivity, monogamy, passion. It's not enough to be in a dead monogamous relationship. I don't believe in dead marriages. I believe in living well springs, fountains of love. And that's how we should conduct ourselves and comport ourselves in society as well. So thank you, Janet, thank you, Dominic, mm -hmm. thank you very much for opening the home to us. Thank you, Brother Kras, thank you, Mushka. I want to thank my wife, Debbie, who's here with me from the States and who puts up with me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> my wife, uh, I have nine children, thank God, she has ten. Okay, you didn't get that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to thank my wife, Debbie, who, uh, I mean, I don't often speak about uh, my wife and my marriage in public, especially talk about aspects of it, but I don't, because, like, as I said, mystery. But I have to say that um, after 11 months of St. Kaddish for my father, and Kaddish is a great distraction, I had to say it three times a day, and God was kind to me, I didn't miss a Kaddish for my father, three times a day, in the middle of coronavirus, organizing my own and Yanam a lot of the time. But it was a great distraction. So coming to Hawaii, where I don't have to go to the every day, um, 
for the blessing and curse. The blessing because I think my wife and I think just trying to, you know, trying to heal from my father's loss. But it's a curse because I have a lot more time to think about my father. It's been very painful. Very painful. I was talking to my wife a lot about it. My wife has been a tremendous comfort to me this past year. Uh, she's been, um, I understand what the Bible says, Genesis 2.24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and leave his mother, and he shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That um, even in the midst of love for our parents, you know, finding that special soulmate. And I thank my wife for all the comfort and, uh, and inspiration she's always brought to me and all of her children, our nine children, my daughter, seven grandchildren, both of them. Um, I say that now because uh, it's the first time Debbie and I have been able to just be uh, a couple alone uh, for the past week, uh, running around Hawaii, and visiting crazy Savannah's family, <laughs> and seeing, going to beautiful beaches where sharks will snap you in half. That is, if you're lucky enough to get there and not drive your car right off the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> or into a cliff. But luckily, none of that can happen since you can't even come into town. Because <laughs> we got the wrong test. <laughs> so, uh, thank you all very much. Go to Kosher Sex. You can buy my book, Kosher Sex. You can buy my book, Kosher Books. You can buy my book. I've written 33 books, which is oh not that God. impressive when you think that many of them have sold 33 copies. <laughs> <laughs> but about 10 of them have been just about love, sexuality, relationships, childhood, etc. Thank you all very much. And uh, mahalo. Yeah.